As Siobhan has said, this, this is a piece of research that uh, I'm, I'm really here under false pretenses because it's a piece of research that was commissioned just as I was leaving. Um, and, and it was ably undertaken by somebody else who cannot be here today, and I've been invited to summarize their research. And, and I hope I can do credit to a very, very fine piece of work, I do think, by Carm Dr. Carmel Duggan from WRC Social and Economic Consultants. And this is one of uh, a suite of three pieces of research that are being undertaken by NDA in the area of natural supports. And I understand that the other two uh, will be looking at what kind of initiatives are nationwide that are supporting natural supports, and also some qualitative work with people with disabilities uh, who live independently and what natural supports mean to them and what contribution they make. So I, I think this is the, the first project past uh, the, the finish line, um, and, and it's an excellent report. It is available on the NDA website, and I would encourage you to, um, to have a look at it. As I say, I, I can really only give you a flavor of it here today, and I hope I do justice to Carmel's excellent piece of work. Very briefly, uh, what I want to look at is just the context for the study. I think that's important, and particularly as the first presentation today, just to remind us where we are and, and where this project came about from. I want to look at some definitions and parameters of the literature. Um, and then I want to get into the, the meat of the study, which looked at different types of natural supports around people's social networks, initiatives that, that are in the literature around promoting natural supports, what are the barriers and facilitators, and then some policy implications that Carmel has drawn together, which I think are very useful. The question that was posed at the beginning of this research was, what is the role of natural supports in facilitating independent living on the part of people with disabilities? So that was the question that was posed, and it really was quite challenging to come to some conclusions on this. There is a complete dearth of literature in this area and Carmel very ably pulled together different pieces of research to, to come to some conclusions. I did say I'd look at the context, and I'm sure you're very familiar with many of these documents from the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, the HSE Congregated Setting Report, the Value for Money, then we have the Americans with Disability Act, independent living strategies internationally. This is the context in which much of us now work it's the context in which we support people to live independently. We are asking for social inclusion. We are listening to people with disabilities. We want them to live within our communities with equality and with equity. And I, I echo the, the um, talk earlier by the minister of whether we actually implement terribly well, because what we aspire to is not necessarily what we have. And I think we may be guilty of failing people in whether we actually include people in our communities or not. We may have the bricks and mortar of people living in communities, but are they actually equal citizens in our communities? That really is what I'd like to look at today. And as I say here, community presence is necessary, but I don't believe it's a sufficient condition for social inclusion. So some definitions, if I might, in, in true academic format. Um, how do we define natural supports? Well, this is, I'm sorry for the, the small writing, it's the Specsavers slide, I apologize. This is a graphic from the expert reference group of the value for money, and what it shows is just circles of support around people with disabilities. And at the center, obviously, is the person, and next is natural support. And they are defined in this piece of work as the first line of support for people with disabilities, then followed by informal supports, local community, etc., and then by more formal supports, such as service providers. And definitions are extremely rare. We might constantly, constantly ask about uh, natural su supports and promote natural supports, but when you actually go to look at how it's defined, it's very rare to come across it in the literature. In the expert reference group, they said natural supports refer to resources inherent in community environments, including personal associations and relationships typically developed in the community, I think that's the important point, that enhance the quality and security of life for people. They continue on 
what kinds of natural supports are we describing? And it's family relationships, it's friendships in the neighborhood, it's fellow students, employees, organizations, clubs, and other civic activities. So it gives you a flavor of what do we mean by natural supports. And what about independent living? Well, again, as the first presentation today is probably mindful to look at what exactly do we mean when we talk about independent living. And for this piece of research, the NDA defined independent living as people with disabilities having choice and control over the support that they need in order to go about their daily lives and any practical assistance being based on their own choices and aspirations. So I think this poses the question, if, as I suggest, formal services have been challenged to support people with disabilities achieving these aims, are natural supports part of a solution here? And then, what about a definition of people with disabilities? Well, the focus of this research was broad, and it was on adults with physical, sensory, intellectual, and cognitive disabilities. But I would have to say to you that the overwhelming majority of research in this area, albeit very small, is almost entirely on people with intellectual disabilities moving to the community from congregated settings and institutions. And it's probably timely to be looking at this given the HSE congregated settings report, which has identified over 4,000 people in this country who live in congregated settings and who will, we hope, be moving to more community-based settings uh, soonest. So Carmel had quite a task to pull all this together, and she did what we all do, which is we go to the academic literature and we put in various search terms and we see what comes out. And what came back was very little research, I have to be honest. So we, we looked at changing the criteria and adding in some terms that, that might make it a little bit broader. And what we came up with was peer-reviewed and grey literature from the year 2000 onward. We excluded employment literature. Now, those of you who work in that field will be aware that the term natural supports has its own connotation in supported employment, and we didn't want to focus on that. We wanted to focus on community living. So the terms that were looked at were things like natural support, social networks, social support, social capital, independent living, social integration, community participation. This is detailed very well in the report, but you can imagine that quite a lot of words were pulled together to try and get to the, the essence of, of what we were looking at here. And in total, 30 core papers were found, 16 supplemental. The findings of the literature, they come in different themes, really, when we're discussing natural support, and they include social networks. What are the social networks like of people with disabilities? There's a a body of work on that. Then initiatives to promote natural support. Again, there's a limited, but there is a body of evidence on initiatives that have been used to promote friendships and natural supports for people with disabilities. From those then can be extracted some barriers, some facilitators, and some policy recommendations. I'm gonna start with social networks. So what the question really is, what's the potential of social networks to provide natural supports and facilitate community participation? Social networks are deemed a key indicator of community participation. If you have friends, if you feel like you belong, if you have support, that is considered a key indicator of community participation, not just the size of your social network. You can have a thousand friends on Facebook and you can still be terribly lonely, but the quality of those relationships. Unfortunately, this whole area is deemed the least successful aspect of resettlement when people with disabilities move from long stay to community settings. And I think this again goes back to how we implement our policies or whether we have the right policies. The composition of networks, what we find is that most of the work is done uh, on behalf of people with intellectual disabilities and looking at their friendships and their relationships. And what we find is that people with intellectual disabilities have very small social networks and that they very often identify staff members as friends. And you would question whether that is reciprocal, whether if staff were interviewed, would they identify people who they support in their job as their friends. What we do know is that people with disabilities themselves report a difficulty in this area, that they don't have adequate support from services in order to maintain their friendships. They find it difficult to get to places to meet people. They find it difficult uh, if they live miles away from the community. They find that maybe social skills are a problem. And also life trajectory of people with disabilities. And what I mean by that is that for some people with disabilities, they don't share in the same activities. They don't move to college. They don't necessarily get married. 
They don't maybe have children, so they lose friends at these crossroads in life where the rest of us may maintain friends. There is unfortunately evidence that services can limit rather than expand the opportunity to develop friendships. And that is said to be because staff tend to prioritize care over social inclusion. And that is reflected in priorities, but it's possibly a resource issue as well. One of the issues that comes up here, and I will allude to it later, is whether friendships and activities between people with disabilities have actually been devalued by researchers like myself and also by service providers. We seem to have a notion that you must have friends who don't have a disability in order to be included in your community. And have we accidentally devalued friendships among people with intellectual disabilities by, by our views here? Now I want to look at some of the initiatives that, that come up in the literature around promoting natural sports. Things like uh, support circles and microboards, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. They're very formal ways of using natural supports to support a person uh, in independent living. Then there are peer-based peer advocacy groups, so groups among people with disabilities. There's also promoting social inclusion by improving social skills for people, and that's an area people with disabilities themselves have been asking for support in. And then more recently, the idea of social capital and befriending. Circles of support, I have a picture here of Judith Snow, who uh, started the, the ideas of circles of support in 1980. Um, they're a very formalized uh, way of supporting a person. Uh, but they can range from a very fluid, informal arrangement right up to a quasi-legal structure like a, a microboard. And the definition is a circle of support, uh, sometimes called a circle of friends, is a group of people who meet together on a regular basis to help somebody accomplish their personal goals in life. There's also support clusters, and those are a circle of support for the supporters. And we'll come across that theme again, that it's not only important to support a person with a disability, but that we also need to support the supporters. Now, the literature indicates that while people with disabilities, and particularly intellectual disabilities, value the support and companionship of peers, researchers and others maybe do not value this to the same extent. And what we notice is that self-advocacy groups are considered widely praised, but other groups among people with disabilities tend to be devalued. So what I'm looking at here is a distinction between what are termed segregated spaces, where people are seen as shut away from the community, and self-authored spaces. And self-authored spaces refer to groups of people with disabilities deciding themselves that they would like a group of people with disabilities and not people who don't have disabilities. And I have an example here of a theatre company in Scotland. All of the actors have an intellectual disability and you cannot join unless you have an intellectual disability. So sometimes these may, see, may be seen as segregated activities, but I think more recently they're being seen as self-authored spaces and that it is important for people with intellectual disabilities to be allowed to have the space to have activities with people with intellectual disabilities alone, and that it is inclusion. Another area that comes up in the literature is social inclusion via social skills. Now, there is a known association between a person's social competency, the level of social competency, and their social inclusion. And people with intellectual disabilities themselves will say that they feel that their lack of social skills is a real barrier to making friends. Unfortunately, what we find is that social skills training programs are typically, they're focused on people with milder levels of intellectual disability, and they don't necessarily generalize into real life. So they're not really meeting that need. What might be meeting that need more is a social capital approach. And here, rather than fitting the person into a society and trying to get a person accepted, here what you're doing is looking to the community and trying to change the, the focus of direction. And befriending strategies are a common intervention here. This is a friendship mediated by service providers with the support of a volunteer. And they are very valued by people with disabilities. The feedback is very positive. But the evidence base, as with many uh, areas in, in this uh, domain, is very poor. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with the idea of community connectors, uh, identifying resources in the community that people can try and foster friendships. And I have an example here of community inclusion officers in Australia. I think that's very much put forward as a, as a, very, uh, a very good model here. 
This is an example of a, a key ring. I, I don't know if you can see the graphic, but this is uh, an intervention in the UK. It just happens to be one that I picked out. There's very many. And the little arrows represent uh, nine people with disabilities who live in this location. Um, all of these people are supported by one volunteer. And the one volunteer is supported by the key ring official head office. All of these people have individualized budgets and they all live a life of their choosing. They report back very positively about this initiative. What I like about it is the idea of mutual support, that everybody is encouraged to show mutual support for other people and to engage other people to meet other friendships. It seems a very positive initiative. But again, the research is, is uh, there's a dearth of research here. There is, albeit small evidence, there is some evidence to suggest that models that seek to build that kind of capacity of people with disabilities to form their own friendships are more effective than those that rely on formal services. There is a catch-22 here. What we find in the literature is that people with disabilities find it difficult to live independently and engage in the community because they don't have friends. But because they don't have friends, they're not involved in their community. And that seems to be the cycle that people are stuck in. What are some of the barriers to natural supports? Well, they come at different levels. Carmel has, has clustered them together in this way. At the individual level, and we do know this, and people with disabilities themselves would say this is a problem, severity of disability and underdeveloped social skills. To me, that maybe is fixing the person to society. At the community level, a lack of community activities and opportunities. Uh, the location of a person's residence, and the minister uh, alluded to this as well, it's vitally important that people are, are located in suitable places. Difficulties in accessing public transport. It's not easy to maintain your friends if you can't see them. At service provider level, ethos, untrained staff, and risk aversive culture. So I'm afraid service providers have a little bit to go here. There can be an ethos of care. There can be staff who would willingly get involved in this area, but they're not trained in active support. They don't have the appropriate training to, and skill here. And there can be a risk aversive culture of befriending uh, initiatives. And I know we'll be hearing a little bit more about this in, in another uh, presentation. Facilitators, we need changes at policy level, not just rhetoric, but a clear articulation of how are we going to address this, this challenge. We need a cultural change at service delivery level, indicators and monitoring systems, clear communication in traffic and training and best practice. And one of the initiatives that's come out is a dedicated support worker, a little bit like the Australian example I gave earlier. Interventions reviewed in the report suggest dedicated roles will only succeed if the role is clearly defined, personnel are sufficiently trained, and perhaps, and I put perhaps because this is one of Carmel's uh, take home messages here, and I do believe it to be so, a focus on social capital rather than social inclusion approaches. So just to wrap up then, what are some of the policy considerations that, that uh, Carmel has, has pulled together here? There's a complete lack of data in this area, and that is a serious obstacle to developing policy. The policies need to be very clearly stated. We have policies moving people from one area to another. We don't really have a clear policy on how exactly are we going to have social inclusion for people. We need desperately training for staff in supporting people in this way, especially if newly dedicated posts to be are established. We need the inclusion of natural supporters as well as people with disabilities in policy development. We need to pilot and evaluate some of the interventions here, and I know that there is some work being done by NDA uh, that's commendable in this area. We need to support the natural supporters. I think that's vitally important. If we're going to involve people more in supporting, they too also need support. And that brings me on to the next point, which I think is a, is a take home point. We need to acknowledge that a move to natural supports does have resource implications. This is not a way of moving away from service providers and, and turning to friends and family to take over a role that somebody else has. That, that is not the aim of, of what's to happen here. What we have, I think, is policies on deinstitutionalization, community participation, independent living. We are falling over policies. Unfortunately, what we may need is another policy. We need policies and services to develop friendships 
We need implementation here for real friendships and real social networks. We are in danger of leaving people very lonely in the community. So a quote to finish, if I can indulge. For a person with intellectual disability to be escorted to a sports club by a volunteer represents a social inclusion approach. For the same person to be actively facilitated to build a network of friends with whom to go to the sports club represents a social capital approach. This distinction has important implications for the development of interventions to support and promote natural supports. Thank you very much.